morning, good afternoon, good evening. You are watching the Paris FinTech Forum Communities video interview series. I'm Elliot Gotkin, and today I'm joined by the founder and co-CEO of Scalable Capital, Eric Podzuvite. Welcome. Welcome, Elliot. Thanks for having me. Okay, so before we get cracking, uh, we're going to learn a little bit more about Scalable Capital. Okay, so Eric, you're an investment platform at your core, I think, but you've got actually a few strings to your bow. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more. Yeah, so um, as you said, we're an investment platform. What does this mean? So basically, if people think about investing, they should think about scalable. Yeah, and investing can mean numerous things for numerous people. If you want to trade uh, Amazon and Tesla stocks, ETFs, funds, if you want to trade that yourself, we have an offering, a brokerage offering, or new brokerage as it's called these days um, and yeah we can talk in more detail what the what's really so neo um, uh, among the new brokers and then we have another uh, business uh, we call this the wealth management or online wealth management business it's basically where we do all the investment decisions for our clients so it's a managed portfolio so people go onto the website they select the risk category and then all the asset allocation all the ETF selection that's been been done for us um, yeah, maybe a couple of words. So the company has been around since 2016. That's when we started um, or did the public launch. And we have over 10 billion in client money uh, across Europe, um, 700,000 clients. And are, we are headquartered in Munich and in Berlin, but we also have an, an office in London. Okay, and of course we've seen you know, rising interest rates uh, this year, which has, uh, perhaps taken the wind out of the sails a little bit of financial markets, uh, even though they've come back a bit. Are, are investors, as a result, more inclined to leave their money in the bank now that they can get even better interest rates there, or at least semi-decent interest rates, or does that make them still search for, for higher returns by investing on a wealth management platform such as yours? That's very interesting. So we see you have to drill down a little bit on the trends. So one thing that you definitely see is that trading activity yeah? if you look on a per user basis trading activity has come down th since 2021 obviously yeah? last year was a bear market for a lot of young investors really the first bear market they ever experienced yeah? and this year even though january had a pretty good start yeah if you just look at the stock market performance it's still a pretty shaky year and um, so what you do see is trading activity especially in single stocks has come down what is still on the rise, it, and it doesn't matter whether it's a bull or a bear market, it, are ETFs, especially ETF savings plans. Yeah? ETF savings plans, I have to explain that a little bit, is basically people set up or they determine a certain amount, whatever you can afford or justify, 20 euros a month, 50 euros, 500 euros a month, 1,000 euros a month, or whatever. They select a, a couple of ETFs or a basket of ETFs, and the money gets automatically pulled from their current accounts and it's being invested. And this is basically, um, I would say, if you teach investing one-on-one -on -one in schools, yeah, if you were to teach it in schools uh, or in universities, this is really the core how you should start. Yeah, build a diversified core ETF portfolio and just do it every month. And this has not seen a decline. This is steadily on the rise. So people, they cost average, that means they when, when the stock market goes down, they buy these ETFs for lower prices. So this you, you see steadily. Um, as I said, stock trading has, uh, the trading activity has come, come down, the ETF savings has gone up. Um, another thing that has come up and come back, uh, as you hinted to, is the entire topic of interest rates. So interest rates, especially in Europe where we operate, were pretty much gone for the last 10, 15 years even, on, in uh, continental Europe for 15 years almost, and interest rates are back. Really in the last 12 months, a huge rise in interest rates. And you see especially the, the new players, yeah, the new new brokers who are leading the way in paying interest rates to clients, not the big banks. And the reason behind that is that the big banks they could pay interest rates, but they also sit on an, on an old balance sheet. That means the other side of the balance sheet where they took the, the client cash, yeah, the deposits, and they invested it in treasuries or they handed it out in mortgages. This is handed out long term at low rates. So it's, it's much harder for them to pay market leading interest rates, whereas young players 
who are building up a new balance sheet, um, they can pretty much almost pass on the, um, the, the high interest rates to clients. Yeah? So sorry for this long uh, uh, speech, <laughs> but it's, uh, th th that's a trend that we're currently seeing. Yeah? That's okay. And I guess also in the wake of Silicon Valley Bank and seeing how uh, you know, some banks perhaps took savings and then invested them and then those investments may have gone down in value, perhaps they're also wary of, uh, of some of these, um, these strategies. But I just wanted to ask you finally about uh, scalable capital. I think you've raised about a quarter of a billion euros from the likes of BlackRock and Tencent. Um, is that enough to get you to profitability if you're not already there? Um, and uh, if you're not yet profitable, uh, give us a sense of uh, when that is likely to happen, since that seems to now be a much bigger priority for investors. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it is a much bigger priority. The investment mentality really changed in the last uh, 12, 18 months. So we are on a clear, we are not um, uh, profitable yet, but we are on a very clear trajectory. Yeah. So Basically, we want to be in a position uh, to be profitable really within the next 12 months. Yeah? Why do I say we want to be in a position? Because ultimately, we still want to grow. Yeah? Um, we still want to grow. We, see, we think there's huge opportunity to build a pan-European digital investment platform. We see actually that client uh, acquisition costs have gone down really for the first time since we started the business because a lot of the smaller players or smaller competitors of ours, they have a hard time funding. They didn't raise a quarter of a billion in, in capital. Um, so we see there's still a great opportunity for land grab, but we still want to bring ourselves within the next 12 months in, into a position where we have our destiny in our own hands, where when the funding environment stays as bad as it currently is or gets worse, we can just stay profitable. Or if the funding environment gets better, you know, you do another capital raise, you accelerate, you build even more products, you go into more markets, but you want to make this decision yourself and you don't want that this decision has been forced upon yourself. So that's, a, that's, that, that's really the plan for the near term future. Okay, so uh, we've heard about scalable capital. Let's now get to know Eric a little bit better. So uh, Eric, I think entrepreneurs get to where they are in all sorts of uh, different routes. Um, I'd love to know how you went from being, I think you started out as a, a statistics tutor um, to, to being a fintech founder. Uh, what was there? Was there a plan to, 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 do, to do this eventually or was it just all a series of uh, coincidences and, and happenstance? Um, yeah, so originally, let's say when I studied, so I studied business with a focus on statistics, yeah, and I uh, taught a little bit statistics at university, if you want. Um, and so back then, I, I finished university uh, in 2006. Hardly anyone from my, the people who did MBAs or business studies um, went into entrepreneurship, yeah. Funnily enough, my, my own father, yeah, I'm, I come from an inter, entrepreneurial family. He's uh, self-employed and has a, a small business. And he never understood why people want to do this. Yeah? He inherited the business from his father, but he always said, you know what, if paid vacations, yeah, travel with all these nice corporate perks, you obviously want to find a nice employer, not, 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 not do self-employment. Yeah? And um, so back then, basically, all of my, my, my peers and my friends, you either wanted to go into consulting or banking, or you wanted to join a big uh, corporate with a brand, I don't know, Siemens or Porsche or Mercedes or whatever. Yeah? And um, so I, um, because I had this mathematical and statistical background, I went into um, investment banking, um, more, spe more uh, specific on the um, on, the trading, uh, on the trading and uh, sales side, um, I joined Goldman Sachs in 2006. That's when I also moved to London. So I saw the, for two years, from 2006 to 2008, I saw the, um, when bankers still had a reasonably good or okayish reputation up until <laughs> the financial crisis. And uh, yeah, then later I worked in Frankfurt for Goldman, so I stayed there for seven years. And then, and now, now I'm actually coming to answer your question, um, then I, I wanted to leave the banking world and I wanted to join this new movement, yeah? this new movement of internet entrepreneurs um, who came up back then, yeah? especially in the, in the Berlin area. Um, so that was, I would say, the second wave of internet entrepreneurs. You obviously had the first one around 2000s with the dot-com crash and then around 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12, the big second wave came back. Um, yeah, and I wanted to 
just simply join this, this big rising tide of internet entrepreneurs. And uh, my first job is actually I didn't found Scalable as straight after I left Goldman. I first joined another startup called Westwing. They did uh, online home and living e-commerce and uh, stayed there for uh, one and a half years and then left and then co-founded Scalable together with um, a couple of colleagues from, from Goldman actually uh, in 2005 and we went live in 2016. Uh, sorry, 2015 we found it and 16 we went live. Okay, and uh, obviously entrepreneurs have lives sometimes outside of, of what they do. I think I saw some pictures of you, uh, maybe they're a couple of years old, but your hair was a little bit longer and I would have said, oh, he looks a bit like a surfer dude. But actually, I understand rugby is your thing and, and, and you, you're pretty good at it. T tell us more. Yeah, so um, your, your, um, your first instinct was also right. So I did a lot of windsurfing. Yeah, so um, I, I actually, I was born in Berlin, and I, but I grew up um, on a small island. Uh, yes, Germany has islands, uh, some, yeah. Um, in the Northern Sea, uh, right next to the Netherlands. That's where my mother is from. Um, very small island, 5,000 people live there. Most of them are related. Uh, and, and yeah, so that, <laughs> that's, where I, that's where I grew up and, and windsurfed a lot. Um, and then when I um, actually uh, went to study in the UK, I studied at uh, University of Warwick and then obviously later worked in, in, in London, I started playing rugby, yeah? and. Um, yeah, that was really enjoyable. And when I then went to Germany, I joined the German rugby club, 1880 Frankfurt, who there are a very few clubs, two or three in Germany, who are semi-professional. Yeah, and they had around 10 professionals. And um, yeah, with the help of those professionals, um, also we were able to win the, the German championship in rugby. So that's, uh, I have that on my uh, CV as well. Yeah. Uh, with Amazing. the help of some professionals. <laughs> and I should say you're, you are the second fintech founder that's uh, been playing professional, semi-professional rugby after Alistair Lukies at uh, Pollinate, whom I know we've had uh, on, the, on the platform uh, a while ago. So, uh, so perhaps, uh, perhaps there's some room for, uh, for collaboration or, or, or common, uh, uh, common, <laughs> common, common interests there. Uh, but look, uh, uh, Eric, a key part of this interview is to get your take on the future of finance. But first, we're going to take a very quick break, after which we're going to continue our conversation with Scalable founder and co-CEO, Eric Podzubat. Welcome back, and don't forget, if you're not already a full member of our community, everything you need to join can be found at www.parisfintechforum.com. And now, Eric, uh, let's talk about the future of finance. So, uh, Eric, earlier this year, we saw the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and uh, the rescue of, uh, of Credit Suisse, or the forced shotgun wedding with, uh, with UBS. Um, were you shocked at what happened? I mean, you were working at, uh, at Goldman Sachs, I think, during the financial crisis of uh, 2008, 2009. Were you shocked? And, and what impact, if any, uh, do you think it's having on where consumers are putting their money? Yeah, um, was I shocked? Um, I was surprised. I mean, bank runs per se are not a new phenomenon, but I was surprised in the, with the particular 
style and specific, uh, in more details with the particular speed this happened. Yeah? So um, as you've mentioned, so um, I just recall that on Thursday night, yeah, that particular Thursday to Friday heading into the Silicon Valley Bank weekend, I got emails from pretty much every one of our uh, venture capital investors saying, hey, have you heard? Uh, did you see the stock price? Do you have money with Silicon? Do you have an account with Silicon Valley Bank? Um, um, pull it out as fast as you can. And I can just imagine that this email, pretty much copy-pasted, uh, was sent around, around the globe, really within a time frame of 24 hours. Yeah? Um, and so I think, I mean, lots has been said about Silicon Valley Bank. Um, but in a nutshell, actually, it was, a combi it, was, it was a unique combination of quite risky, or one could even say bad treasury management. And on the other side, they had a non-diversified uh, deposit client base. So basically, they, I, I can just imagine that they looked at their clients and said, well, these are 60,000 individual corporations. Some doing e-commerce, some doing fintech, some doing social network stuff, whatever, AI stuff, very diversified. It turns out that that's not the case because behind these 60,000 corporations are probably 50 to 100 venture capital investors who, if they send an email, it's a, it's a bank run by definition. So, um, and Credit Suisse had their own problems, but what I'm trying to say is I don't think we are in the midst of a next, a new financial crisis. I think the problems were very specific to these institutions. I think they're also contained now. Yeah? On the deposit side, yeah, clients and depositors are safe. But what amazed me most was really the speed. Yeah? Because historically, people had to go to a bank and queue up and make up their mind and queue up and get whatever cash they could carry at home. That, that so typically bank runs happens. Now, all these startup entrepreneurs, they can wire millions of money on their cell phones within minutes. Yeah? So I think 42 billion of client money left Silicon Valley Bank within a couple of hours. This is unprecedented. Yeah? The, the, the speed of this bank run never happened in the history. And I think if you see a regulatory change, um, I think the capital requirements are, uh, of banks are good and much more sound than in the last financial crisis. I think one really needs to look at the um, just the new, uh, yeah, the, the new piping, the new infrastructure, and the new speed um, with, um, um, uh, that's available these days. And I think the regulator probably has to come up with some circuit breakers um, for for these. Um, Twitter posts, emails, I go into my banking app, money is gone immediately. I think this, this, the, there needs to be a circuit breaker in between, in, in between okay. these lines. And some now think that the troubles in the banking sector may make a recession even more likely, uh, particularly in the United States. Um, what do you think? And, and again, does this make consumers more likely to invest, to try to get more growth, or more likely to keep their money you know, stuffed under the mattress or in a systemically important bank that they know would never fail. Yeah. I think for medium, short to medium term, it's what you've mentioned. Yeah, I think the flight to safety, risk, volatility, uh, insecurity increased. Yeah, and this is never good uh, for in, uh, investing. Yeah, um, um, so that's, 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 one, um, that's one consequence. I think... Um, did it make a recession more likely? I think it speeded up the process where the, um, the federal banks wanted to head anyhow. Yeah? So there's a clear mandate, obviously, uh, and a clear momentum to tighten financial conditions because of the rising inflation. And the tightening financial conditions can happen if you make money more expensive, but also if banks get more afraid and want to run their business safer. So I think the Silicon Valley, Credit Suisse, and also Signature Bank or so, that in general also tightened financial conditions more. Um, and but, uh, and yeah, it's, it might even make further interest hikes, hikes less likely, but it certainly, um, it certainly um, increased uh, the pressure or um, yeah, tightened financial conditions uh, further, which will have a deflationary um, component, which is good, but deflationary component also comes a lot of the times with a heightened risk of, of a recession. I think this goes hand in hand, and I think this, yeah, this is what we are 
currently observing. However, yeah, if I might add, I think it happens in a much more orderly fashion than what we have seen in last big banking okay. crunch. Yeah, it's much more orderly and controlled. Okay, so I want to ask you something slightly more, more general about uh, financial services right now. I think uh, uh, Scalable Capital started uh, with a kind of robo-advisory. I think that's still a part of your, of your business. It doesn't really seem to have captured consumers' imagination, but do you think the excitement and possibilities created by ChatGPT and other um, you know, AI programs and possibilities make this more appealing, that, that AI will both improve the appeal of, of robo-advising and also make people more interested in, in, in putting their money with robo advising mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. So um, near term, I don't think so. Long term, yes. Yeah. I mean, so obviously, if people get more and more used to using uh, artificial intelligence applications in their daily lives, may it be for, I don't know, helping your children get through their homeworks yeah, or making your your, your life easier here and there, and the confidence rises, I think they will also have more confidence in trusting these systems to manage and run their money. But it's too early, too early, to, it's, it's too, too early to, to tell now. Okay, and, and I think uh, Scalable is or was at certainly a unicorn at its last um, fundraising round. Um, valuations have come down across the board, especially in the fintech space. Do you think valuations in general in the fintech space have bottomed out or, or is there further to fall? Mm, you can't see uh, currently. Yeah? So, um, so we did our last funding round two years ago. We haven't fundraised since. We don't need to fund, fundraise if we don't want to, as I just described earlier in, 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 our, in our interview today. Um, so no one really knows where valuations are uh, currently. And you have seen some repricing. Yeah, so I mean, the most obvious one obviously being with Klarna, who, who had to um, raise on a down round valuation. With a lot of others, especially the big fintechs, let's, let's, let's look at the neo banks, they haven't fundraised, so no one really knows where the valuations are. I think this is also the, the current standoff in the industry. Yeah? There is a lot of money, a lot of dry powder on the venture capital side, and there is still demand to get this money on the startup side, but it's a bit like the homeowners market in, in Germany right now. Uh, refinancing rates have gone up four or five times, which means that prices need to go down for people to still make it attractive to buy and own a property, but prices are not coming down because sellers don't want to acknowledge that. So nothing's happening in the, in the, in the, in the normal retail uh, um, uh, uh, private uh, re uh, residential market, n there, there are hardly any transactions right, right now. And this is, uh, this is quite true for the fintech world. I think, uh, uh, and not to dodge your question, but to answer it, I think we will find out really in the next six to, 12, uh, six to, to nine or to 12 months. Because a lot of companies who need to raise, they will run out of money in the next six, nine or 12 months. <clears throat> and then you will see then you will see the, the, the truth, really. Yeah? Um, and my view is it, it hasn't buttoned uh, out yet. Yeah? Uh, um, at least not for the companies that are mediocre or haven't quite found product market fit. It definitely hasn't buttoned out. For companies who have pro found product market fit and who have, have a, a strong brand, they can even profit from this scenario because competition is, is, is gone. Um, but over the entire industry, I think uh, the next 12 months will still be bumpy because before, we see, uh, before we see better days. Okay. So look, Eric, it's time now for our rapid fire round of questions. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, so I've got 90 seconds on the clock. Uh, when the, my phone alarm goes off, we'll, we'll stop. Just one word answers is all I'm after from you, and away we go. What fintech segment has the biggest potential over the next five years? Investing. What is the biggest pain point in your everyday financial life you'd like to see resolved? Committees and processes. <laughs> are we at the beginning, middle or end of the fintech wave? We are at the beginning. Do you have a metaverse strategy? No. Do you think EU and US regulations have kept pace with all the new possibilities and behaviors we're seeing in the financial industry? Uh, no, and if I might add a bit of a 
Uh, okay. so I'm not no adding. How would you describe <laughs> how would you describe non fungible tokens NFTs? A a scam. B an interesting concept. Scam. C part of the future. Scam. Okay. Scam. Uh, have you ever personally invested in crypto? Yes. Uh, are physical points of sale part of the future of finance? Yes. On a scale of one to 10, 10 being the most likely, one being the least likely, how probable is it that in the next 10 years, one of the neobanks will be as profitable as a top tier legacy bank? Seven. CBDC, central bank digital currencies become a mainstream reality in the US and EU? No. You'll be able to open a crypto account at a top tier uh, bank? No. <laughs> so that's a zero. Okay, fine. All right, well, we are out of time there, Eric. So thank you for, for being a good sport. Uh, and I'm afraid that's uh, all we've got time for for our conversation. So I really just want to thank you, Scalable Capital founder and co-CEO, Eric Poduvite, for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you, Elliot. That's been fun. Uh it has. And for everyone watching, we will be back again next time with another big name from the world of finance and technology. We do hope you'll join us again then. In the meantime, don't forget to subscribe to the Paris Fintech Forum YouTube channel and to follow us on Twitter at Paris Fin Forum. That's all for now. See you next time. Bye bye.